Good morning, Facebook. As you know, um, it's always a good time to be here in person, but we love the fact that you plug in outside because hopefully you're out selling a house, talking to people, making a living and changing lives. But when you have time, um, make sure to come to class here at the Paradise Valley location. And with all that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Do you have something you're not updating? Like I don't know any of these people. Hey, Lloyd, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Come on in, have a spot. There's an extra table. It's so nice. Either one. I don't know how this way. Is Caroline coming? Okay. All right, um, Scott, do you want to sit like down here? Are you yeah. happy where you are? Yeah. If you're happy, then I'm happy. Hey, Jen, how's it going? You good? You got Captain Floyd? I know you're happy. I see your shut up. All right, well, I just want to thank you all for getting in the mojo for um, Valentine's Day week. And now, I'm not a big Valentine's Day girl, but when it comes to using any holiday to market myself, in real estate or have a love for real estate, I'm just gonna say houses are the one that I'm in love with for the week. <laughs> My husband, if he buys me anything from Hallmark stores or anything else, I just ask why he wasted the money and then went for clearance. So <laughs> there we be. So um dedicate your time, make it fun, use hearts, great week to do it. Caroline, we have a spot for you. <laughs> um I was really thrilled when our friend agreed to teach this class because we just went over last week, right? Was it last week we did price pointing? using the MLS. Now I'm going to tell you nothing replaces the multiple listing service and how you utilize that as a tool. And nothing really replaces a lot of the free tools we receive with Realty One Group. However, RPR is one of those spaces that does a lot of replacing when you can use it properly and makes your value soar. It is also an included benefit by being a National Association of Real Firm member. So no matter what, when you think about like, why do I pay my association fee? Why do I care about being a realtor through NAR? This is one of those dockets that go, oh my gosh, this one tool alone I paid for and you only pay NAR like $175 a year out of all those dues. So just some thoughts. Um, Bree is here with us today and has a few things to share. Hi, everyone. Hope you guys had a great weekend, a great crazy weekend uh, with friends and family. Just wanted to pass this out as a reminder, Rock University, every Thursday at 1 o'clock, we go over marketing and lead gen school. Um, and it's a live training, but we also have everything um, library and recorded in our VIP section of Rock University. So if you haven't checked out the VIP section yet, uh, we have lots of different um, templates for you guys, social media newsletters, all kinds of crazy stuff in there for you guys. Um, and there's lots of social media posts for Valentine's Day talking about houses. How then realtors love houses. See, it's all about houses. <laughs> yep. So I'm going to pass this out. It also has, we have two other locations opening up in the next quarter. So surprise and Chandler. So I will uh, pass this around. Thank you guys. Um, also, don't forget one rock stars, <coughs> ROC stars.com is specifically for ROG tools. So, VIP access is um, free. Hey, Craig, how's it going? I'm um, great, you guys. Hey, guys, he is the future National Association of Realtors Treasurer. Did you know Craig's running? Great. 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 Now, so yeah, it's kind of like when I go to a listing appointment, they go, well, I might get a list. No, I have a listing. I'm going to a listing appointment. Craig's going to be running, so he is the one and the only treasurer. And there's, no, there's a high probability. <laughs> But in our hearts, Craig, you won. All right. Hasn't even begun, but you won. Now, with no further ado, the best instructor in the Valley for very last, last teaching for at least the next four years. Four years, right? <laughs> four years. And I'm just going to do it, Susan. So I'll tell them. Fine. Can I? No posting. No posting. You cannot post. The awesomeness I'm about to share, even though it is being recorded and it's on our private Facebook group. Cannot post on Facebook. Do not post on Facebook. Susan has been appointed to be the Arizona Real Estate Commissioner. Moving forward. Oh. 
Our last training broker to broker um, event together is right now for at least four years, but knowing Susan, she'll be there for a lifetime and make a difference for all of us on a continued basis. So our new boss, Susan Nicholson. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah, that happened in the last couple of weeks. That's an interesting process. Yeah. When's the notification go public? Uh, Wednesday or Thursday this week, the governor's press secretary's office is going to make a public announcement. After that, it's a free for all you may post. But uh, but until the governor is the person who should be the first person to post is basically the rule. So um, yeah, so thanks for coming to my very, very last RPR training class. Um, it feels really weird. Uh, it's super bittersweet having to wind all of the things down that I do and know that I'm not going to be able to identify as a realtor next week. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, maybe they don't understand what all you have to give up to do. This. Oh, they do because I negotiated a very high compensation. I made it very clear what I was giving up. <laughs> so. well, the members oh, don't know. These guys don't know. Um, I am very involved in uh, real organized realtor world. Uh, so I am currently, for another couple of days, the president elect of WeServe. Um, so you ascend to president of the association after you're elected to be their president elect. And I have to resign from that position. Um, in real estate, we have a top gun school of, of uh, like, you know, it's where the best of the best go to get training to get better. Uh, it's called Tom NARLA. Teaching. What's that? Just Tom Green's teaching. You know, you, like you wish, right? But you do get, you do get the all-star lineup. Um, you know, your day starts out with Bob Goldberg on your first meeting, and then it's just an amazing education that you get. So it's called... Uh, National Association of Realtors Leadership Academy. They choose 20 members a year. It's an application process and an interview process uh, that is very hard. It took me two tries to get into NARLA. I'm part of the NARLA 23 class, and I will also have to give that up. Um, I had to give up my trip to Cancun because as a President Circle member. Uh, that is heavily subsidized by the National Association of Realtors, and that could be seen as a kickback. Had to give up a trip to Hawaii that I won at a Ray Pack auction last year. Again, a realtor owned that house. And so um, it would look inappropriate for the commissioner to take that trip. Um, it would look absolutely fine. Right, exactly. It, it, I have to. Um, I have to close my company. I have to close my brokerage. I have to close my school. I cannot have an interest in anything real estate going forward, and so I had to give up my pipeline, which was significant. Um, and uh, that is um, that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of things that you have to sort of say. I'm not going to do that anymore to uh, assume this role of protecting the public and regulating licensees. So. Status of your license becomes inactive. Yeah. So I I this was a big sacrifice this part yeah. and I applaud her for that. Yeah. She's a good representative for our There, you know, there's much good, good, good to be done. I really believe that over 90% of realtors and licensees, if, if they knew how they would and they would do better and they would do right. And I see opportunities for the department to create those opportunities in a lot of partnerships. There will be areas where we might butt heads, but I think in well over the majority of it, the department and, and realtors are on the same page. And uh, I look forward to, to being able to take what I know from 20 years of being a practicing broker and a practicing educator and a practicing realtor to the department and then working with that regulatory authority to there's a lot of ways that we can make things better that best protect the public, but also are going to help you guys with licensees and as educators. And so um, I have lots of work to do. I'm eager to get started there. And uh, that's uh, the 21st is my start date as your commission. Okay. Okay.
But today we're going to learn an amazing tool from the National Association of Realtors. Um, all of you guys as members are a part owner of the Realtors Property Resource. Like Mandy said, it's not a replacement for the MLS, but more than not a replacement for the MLS, it is not a replacement for your local market knowledge. Period. End of story. This is not going to give you knowledge where you don't have knowledge, basically. So it, it's going to make pretty reports. It's going to impress your clients. It's going to streamline how you can approach a new listing and make it easy. But the key component that makes RPR such a special tool is you guys and your market knowledge and your understanding of what's happening. Because I think all of you guys probably pretty easily can agree if you're pretty active out there in the market, the media and the reports, whether it's the Cromford report or data coming out of ARMLS, are always weeks behind what we know and what we're feeling. We know, we knew, oh, wow, I'm busy again. Great. Meanwhile, all the sort of looking backwards reporting was saying like, real oh, estate market's dead. And it's like, no, it's not. But you won't catch up for a month. That is the critical knowledge you need to make RPR work for you. That's what makes you the area expert. So, okay, so here we go. I tried to, pu I pulled up this house because you should never create a report and give it to a homeowner that starts with this picture, <laughs> right? So um, that is not going to wow them at all. <laughs> so the first thing that you're going to need to do is change that picture. So there's an area up here in this blue bar called My Update. And if you click on that, there's an area for you to edit photos. So add or edit photos. And I'm going to upload. And I took the liberty of uh, downloading a picture of a front of a house. That's not this house, but it's close enough. Um, and then I'm going to say right here, last edited, no photos selected. And we are going to one photo selected, and then I'm going to make that the report cover. And then the cover photo has been set. Now you're not going to be sending a picture of a wall. Like that is so important. And it's not one of the things that are in too many of the property classes. So it's not going to show in here. It will show when you print your reports, basically. That it's not going to change the property information page. If you guys don't have these, things down here, then you're not running the latest version of RPR. So you need, that, that is, uh, that's the easiest way to see the latest update. If you're not seeing this on your RPR, you're not going to have that little My Updates button, but it was one of the things that we gave them in feedback. We, we, I don't want to look all over RPR to figure out how to change this picture or change this or change that. Just put it on the top. And so that's why you have a My Update. So we're going to look yeah. How did you get like to the Oh, you guys go right into here from your MLS. So this is Mandy's RPR and she logs in to MLS and then from MLS it's on your menu and you can log into RPR and that's probably the easiest way for everybody to get in there. Go in via your MLS. And then are you on a property report? I am. So what I did was I keyed in a property address. So now in RPR you have a full search bar right here. So you can go ahead and search and you can say you want sales or leases and you want public records or not public records and you can go down to more filters and you can go crazy, but that's a full search functionality. Here's a fun fact that you guys can use to generate business. Um, I have a big referral network in Central Florida. I grew up in Central Florida. It's where I started my career in Central Florida. And so Every year, I send an RPR mini property report to every person in Central Florida via email now. Um, it used to be hard copy, but as emails became more prevalent, now they get a PDF and I save money in paper. Um, and I email it to them, and I email it to them usually around the holidays and say, like, just thinking of you, I know your home is one of the most um, important assets that you have in your portfolio. What we know as realtors is that it is the benchmark of what builds generational wealth and stability for households. I just wanted you to have the latest and greatest um, market update. And so you can do a market activity report nationwide. You can do a specific property report nationwide and you send it over there. So what I learned through trial and error is if you send that over, they go, oh, wow, thanks. What you have to do is ask. You have to say, 
if you are going to make any real estate decisions, you're going to sell, you're going to buy, you're going to start investing, please contact me and let me know so that I can put you in touch with a top-notch professional that I know will take care of you in your market. There's a broad spectrum of levels of professionalism in real estate, just like anything else. And so you guys can put that out there. So that was like the second step. I started doing that. Well, then what you encounter, because we're all on social media and we're all putting out, we're doing this and we're doing this and we're doing this and we're doing this. My sphere of influence decided that I was too busy. They didn't want to bother me with their little thing. So then I finally was just like, well, let's try this. And that Florida Realtor we will do a referral fee and I will be compensated for being able to connect you to a top level of professionalism. And what you'll just have done is switched over your sphere to say, oh, I can help Susan. And then they will help you and you'll get those referrals. So go all the way with it, be totally transparent, say that you're gonna get a referral fee for you know connecting them with the top notch professional. It's a win-win situation and you're gonna, you're gonna get it. So use the mini property reports for that and the market activity reports. So two things to do. When you first get the call, everybody wants to know about what my house is worth, but you haven't walked it, you haven't seen the condition of it, you know, picture. You can look at all the history. I, I, I know uh, sellers will come to it and say, it looks just like it did when I bought it. And you think, okay, but what does it smell like? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. Or, okay, you didn't do upgrades, but what's the wear and tear? Um, you know, did you have an elderly dog that had bladder issues for the last several years of its life and there's stains all over the place? That is the case in, you know, in this house. That, that was one of the things. But he was like, no changes since I bought it. And he means no upgrade since he bought it. Because when you live in a property, there are changes since you've bought it. So, the first tool that you guys can use, and I kind of looked at this as like a quick down and dirty, is this orange one called Refine Value. And when you click on Refine Value, this is where your, your, your knowledge goes. So it's never going to have bedrooms. It's going to pull from public database information, and the county recorder doesn't record bedrooms. So you're going to want to go ahead and plug in the number of bedrooms. It has this as two and a half bathrooms. So it says two full bathrooms and one partial bathroom. That's actually incorrect. There's no half bathroom in this property. So you're going to correct that county record. And then if the square footage needs adjustment, lot size, year built or anything, you're going to take care of that. And you're going to click this little update facts. And it may or may not change the number over on the right side of the screen, the 382,000. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Then you're gonna go into this little refined value. So maybe when you were on the phone, they said, well, we just put in a fabulous new backyard or we just upgraded the kitchen. We just did this or we just did that. So you're thinking mental note, that's gonna be a little bit better because they've just done an upgrade. If they say, I updated the kitchen, you need to say, when did you update the kitchen? Yes. Yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. So because that does matter. So if you had any improvement, this guy did it. This guy was like, the house is exactly the way it was when I bought it. No, the house is worse than when you bought it because you've lived there and you've done things. So then you get here. This is where your local market knowledge comes into play. You know if that pocket of real estate is still sluggish or if it's gangbusters, if your supply is low in that, or if that's actually one of the segments where supply is just fine and days on market are higher. And so that's where you're going to make these adjustments. And this is what makes you different than Zillow and Redfin and everybody else. It's these adjustments that's based off of your knowledge. Now, say you don't know, that's when you're probably gonna book an appointment with Mandy and she's gonna go geek out in the MLF with you and she's going to show you how you can determine if a neighborhood or if a zip code or micro neighborhood, macro neighborhood, any of those things are hot little pockets that you need to adjust for because you're gonna look at the days on market and the conversion rates and everything else. Or if you guys are Cromford Report subscribers, Cromford can help you with that data too. So local market conditions for these little starter homes and the inventory available is a little bit better in this particular subject property. It's not eight months ago, but it is a little bit better 
than average because of entry level pricing. It's under that $400,000 single family residential. And then the home's exterior. Okay, well, um, he did fess up that there were three dogs and they were diggers and he hasn't gotten around to digging the hole that was done right next to the house. And hmm, not really thinking the backyard is looking all that pretty. So I'm gonna say, we're gonna say it's not trash, but it's probably not as great. And then the home's interior, well, I haven't seen it yet. I'm just gonna keep it as equal. Once you see it, I'm gonna notch that sucker down about halfway into the interior range because that's what, what I learned when I did the walkthrough of it. Um, and then you've got your lot size. Oh, you look on the map, it's cookie cutter. It's the same size as everything else. You've got your view. It's that's, he's got a block wall, but you've got your privacy and it's a little bit less. And so, um, so you do those adjustments and it's gonna give you this refined value. But what it's going to do more than that is give you a range. And at this stage, that's really what you're looking for. So this is where you would go to create your first little report to say, let me, and I like to use the mini. If you wonder what's in the mini report, you can hover over every one of these little eyes and it's gonna give you a sample of that page. So it's gonna say your list price, your refined price, the comparable price, going to go into property values, listing price, comp analysis data. And if you put in information on this, it's going to do it. So we're going to run that report. And this is something that I would probably email and say, here's a ballpark range figure based off of our conversation. I look forward to meeting you so that I can further refine this value. So never, ever, ever Am I going to not do those quick little basic refinements? Because what I don't want is Melissa coming in after me with the exact same number and then showing them on RPR that I did nothing. And I've done that. <laughs> I've seen an RPR report. I've recognized that that's an unadjusted value. And I said, let me show you something. And then I said, I work harder than that. I don't know who gave you that report, but I work harder than that. <laughs> <laughs> right? I want that listing. So don't do that. Don't don't be the one. Um, so we're going to download that. Mandy, you're going to have to delete all these downloads. But oh, kidding. I don't mind. Download away my Okay. So Mandy has uploaded her picture. She's uploaded her company logo. Mm -hmm. There's little um, help menus if you guys don't have those in your RPR reports yet, but you can customize it. See how it subbed out that picture? If I snapped a picture and did it. So obviously, rather than stealing the past MLS picture or something like that. If you have a side view, you probably want to do a drive-by and take a picture of it before you send a report. Can you also, well, I know you're out of there, but can you also just go around the corner on your street? Because I'm seeing the you Google can. Maps. Yeah, yeah, you can. You can like Google map it and you can walk over and you can use your snipping tool and you can snap it and download it and upload it. You can do it that way as well. Yep. Um, so that's the quick little, that page is going to be there. Then you're going to get this. And it's going to say, the current estimated value was 382. I refined you up to or down to 379 based on what you told me. But the range is anywhere from 337 to 429. So I need to come in there and I need to see it. And then once I see it, I can do a much more accurate run through of your market. So that's where you're going to stop using the refine tool. And you're going to go over and you're going to start using your CMA tool in RPR when you want to get much more specific. Now you've got, so now you've gone out to the house and on your drive in, you're realizing, oh, it is quite industrial in this area. This is not a tree lined pretty street coming in here. There's a lower category pricing type of housing as I'm driving in and you turn the corner and I'm in the subdivision. So I already know my marketing instructions on how you're going to drive in, not that any of us use that, we use GPS, but I'm going to make my best effort to bring people in through the proper entry of the subdivision, not the shortest route because the shortest route is Pekka ugly and I represent the seller and the seller's best interest. But I also know that I have to account for that in pricing because when the buyer actually comes down to like, this is the property I'm gonna buy, 
hopefully they're driving all around that area in their due diligence period. And the GPS is likely to take you to the other area. Oh yeah, absolutely. My GPS took me to the ugly area. So I was like, oh, this is, this is not pretty. The one thing that's nice is you automatically know as soon as you plug it in there, here's the closed data. So these are things that we usually go to Monsoon to gather all the data. A lot of this information is just right there in uh, RPR for you. So a lot of times I just start in RPR because it combines everything for me in one page. So now we're going to go and we're going to do this, create a comparative market analysis using comps. So this is separate from the report. This is separate. So that first report was, I just got a listing call. I want to send a little thing. I did a little bit of work based on our phone conversation. Let's set up a time and let me go ahead and refine this. Because that report looks really impressive that you send over where they're like, wow, she, she's already working hard for me. And that's what RPR is designed to do. It's designed to make the charts and the graphs and shows like you track the property's value of what happened and the number of listings and everything. The little report is very impressive. The comparative market analysis report is for when a buyer's broker says, I'm not really understanding how you got to your price. Oh, well, let me send you a CMA. You know, well, I the appraiser. When the appraiser is going to come, the CMA is designed to look a whole lot like an appraisal. And so a lot of times if I can, you know, get in front of the appraiser ahead of time, I send it over and I say, this is how we did the comparison. What's important is we cherry pick on these things, right? We're, we're going for apples and apples and they're going for apples and apples. If there's something that looks like it belongs in the bag, but it doesn't, you need to discount that. You need to say, I didn't use this comparable because it smelled like a cat urinal and the neighbors told me in a signed statement. And, you know, so there's actual work that you're doing as a realtor for your client and discrediting it, not just that number doesn't work for what I'm trying to achieve because that doesn't work with an appraiser, right? But if that number doesn't work, why didn't it work? And start making the phone calls to those agents that are listed in the history to see if you can get to the bottom of why it didn't work. And then put together a statement, validate it either with the past agents, with the neighbors, with what, whatever you have to do to put something together to then say to the appraiser, you need to throw that one out because that one was not the same because, and that's why you have to skip over that next door neighbor house that's the exact same square footage and make and everything, or you have to adjust for the stigma that that property has. So I want to just understand, you're running the mini report based off a of phone conversation, yeah. and you're bringing that to the listing appointment, and then later you're sending the CMA report after you've seen the property? Right. So um, usually I send over that, that thing, and I go, this is, you know, I point out the range, so I'll sort of say, this is a big range. You'll see on page two of the report, the range for your property value is between here and here. I've made minor adjustments based off of our phone conversation. At this point, it's imperative that I go in and see your so house. You send it before. I send it before. Okay. I usually send my mini reports when I'm booking my appointment so that I can okay. go in there, take copious notes, and find out what they're willing to do, not willing to do. Sometimes they're going to say, well, if I sell it as is, how long and how much can you sell it for versus if I fix all these things, right. how long and how much can you sell it for? And they're doing that, you know, sort of cost to investment analysis. And okay. so, yeah. yeah. And just to tag on to that, look what she's done in the process. She's made contact, sent this or something. She's visited the property, talked to the seller. Now she's worked her way into her next third appointment for her contact. The real question is, how many realtors out there try to do it all for the first time? So look at the whole process when you're doing it. Right. So all this time I'm establishing my value. I don't consider myself a discount broker. And so really, I know one of the main questions that a seller is always going to ask me is, or have in their head, why am I paying you that much money? What are you actually worth? So I use this tool to showcase and make me look like a shiny penny that just works her little tushy off 24 seven. So don't make the mistake of getting off the phone, going boop, boop, boop on the sliders and click, click, and then send them a report in five minutes because then you just devalued yourself and what you're, you're trying to pump up your value. Like go have lunch and maybe 
happy hour, whatever, and then do your boop, boop, boop and send it over because in their mind, you've just spent hours. You got off the phone and you got busy for them. Same thing when you're showing houses. They, um, right now, there's opportunities for you to go out there and show 10 houses in one day because we have a little bit of inventory and the market's not moving as fast. It's picking up, but it's not what it was. And you know there was a pretty penny and you want to kind of bring their focus back to that because that's probably as close as they're going to get in their price point. Again, it goes your knowledge base against their hopes and dreams and wishes. And so that mini property report, usually I pull it from my phone before I've even like moved forward and I'll have it downloaded into my report. I'll wait about two and a half hours after getting home and unwinding and then I'll send it and I'll say, I don't know about you, but I felt like with your reactions, the amount of time we spent in listings, the feedback that you were giving me inside the home, this one seemed to be the leader of the pack today. So I took the liberty to put together a little report for you in case you are talking about this house and further considering it. If there's any other properties that you want me to send you a little bit more analysis on before we do a deep dive, right? So I'm letting them know this is just scratching the surface of what we're going to do. Again, you're establishing your value and you're making them feel comfortable about your expertise. And it took you eh, less than Less than three to five minutes once you get good at these little sliders. And, and as long as you're working in an area where you have a scope of expertise. So, okay, one click RSVP. Mandy, they want you to go to class. Okay, oh, so confirm facts. So now we're going to go into that deeper dive. I've been in here. I will admit I use the MLS to pull my comparables. They do have a full search function in RPR, has the same data. It's that old dog new trick kind of thing. It's just faster for me to go into the MLS, choose my three to four properties that I want to do a side-by-side -side comparison on and plug and go. Then it is for me to learn all the nuances of RPR search functionality, but you can get there both ways. So confirm facts. So it's gonna save all the things that we did before, but now I can go into a little bit more detail. So now it's gonna say like concrete, roofing, number of stories. And I'm gonna say, yep, all that's right. I've been to the property, I've walked it, and I have a pretty good idea at this point. <laughs> then the next thing we're gonna do, it highlights it for you, is find your comparables. This is bringing you up to a search. So I wanna look at pending, active under contract, and I wanna look at closed primarily because now I'm really trying to nail it down. I'm going to say within the last six months, cause we were a little sluggish there for a while in the last three months and we didn't have a tremendous turn in value. Um, I might have to make some adjustments if it's closer to the August, September, October range. I might have to make some adjustments because I understand the market did do a whoa in some of that time period. Then I've got my three bedrooms. It's saying, do you want me to pull three or fours? I'm gonna say, I want you to pull four bedroom houses. I want you to pull two bathroom houses because I wanna go as cookie cutter to cookie cutter as I can. Um, I don't wanna go all the way up to 1200. I think this one was 1600. So I might do like 17. 50, I think that'll give me about 100 over. And I don't want to go that small. I think I want to go to 1501. So try to get something in there. Lot size, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to tell it that I want it to do it based off of price. The year built is staying in there pretty new. And now I'm going to hit search. And it's going to search just in this map area. So if I wanted to search in a bigger area, I can do that. I can uh, make the map smaller or I can drag the map or I can customize it. The map, seeing it right away on the map, some neighborhoods have this, this series of houses was one price point, this series was another price point, this series was another price point. Again, local market knowledge. You guys really working within the scope of your expertise or doing the legwork and figuring, you know, learning it to be up to that speed. And so I might easily look at the map and say, ah, yeah, the three, 83 is the subject property. The 351 was a lower tier of housing. The 440 was a higher tier of housing. I need to adjust for that if I'm going to use those comparables. And so 
Then you go down here and you're going to choose which ones you want to use as your comparable. So I'm just going to go one, two. I'm not saying these are actually the ones that I would pick. If I really wanted to get into the nitty gritty, I would click on this and then this is going to open up a new window. It's going to give me the property report on this. And then I can go through and I can creep on all the past MLS pictures of it. And I can look at the refined value and what it had and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and I can see all the effort. Could we go back one um, yeah. if possible? Because some of the properties on the list have stars in them. So I think that means they were used in the RVM. Yep. Yes. That is correct. If it's a refined value model um, that they came up with. Mm -hmm. the Yep. So the realtor valuation model, if that was part of that initial, this is how we created your range. And when you were using your refine tool, if they use that comparable in there, it'll have a little star next to it. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so I'm going to choose four because appraisers seem to like to, you know, start with four on the first page. That's the only reason. I make it kind of look like a little mini appraisal. And then I'm going to update the valuation and close over here on the right. And now I get to go down and adjust the comparable. Yeah. Real quick, do you use just closed data for the four? Mm -hmm. If I can, if I can use closed data within you know, three or four months right now, again, you're going to go based off of how fast the market is changing. Um, if I can use closed data, that's preferable. If I use a pending sale, so when I'm looking at the pending listings and if that one's apples to apples and that listing agent is willing to give me some happy good information then i might use that and substantiate it with a phone call with the listing but yep i'm going to use closed data because the the active data is just us wishful thinking or some not us our sellers wishful thinking mm -hmm. right we pretty much know. So here we go. I like to always click on use bigger pictures because my eyes are getting old. Like literally, this is a magnifying glass. That is how old my eyes are getting. Um, <laughs> they're called modern monocles and my daughters are very funny. They bought me three. Um, so you can go ahead and rearrange them. You can say, show this one first, show that one second, you know, to, to how you're going to have the conversation with the seller. And then you can say, how does this property compare to the subject property? So maybe when you're looking through pictures, one of them has been completely modernized. Mm -hmm. One of them is way worse. Like, okay, there was a fire and you did nothing. Um, and so you have to go through, or you're gonna say, eh, they're, they're pretty much the same. And so you can, you can assign little weights just by saying it's better than the subject property or it's worse than the subject property. Then you get to go down here and you get to look at this. So here's your subject property. Here's the information. Do you need to make any refinements that are based off of that? And then you can enter your text right here. So this is where you may say, okay, include this in my reports or don't include it in my report. So if you're gonna say this house is so much prettier than the subject property, don't put that in your report. That's very insulting. <laughs> you stick it to this house has an upgraded kitchen. If you know, for example, on a pending property, mm -hmm. say it's listed for 700 and they let you know that it's under contract at 90, mm -hmm. is there a way to adjust that number? Yeah. So you would go in, it's going to have the pending property value, and you would bump it down and say it's a little bit worse to make the number go down. And you can keep bumping it until it's pretty close to what they told you. And then in the notes that you're going to display, had a conversation with the listing agent and confirmed that the property is under contract for 690. Okay. So you're not saying the house is worse necessarily. You're just saying in order for me to adjust it at this point, this is how I had to do it. And this is another, you know, super quickie way to get to your refined property value. So we're going to go ahead and play with this. And we're going to say this one's like two ticks worse. This one's like one, uh, yeah, uh, we'll say like three ticks better because it's at 449 or maybe even four ticks better because it's got a three car garage and everything. And we'll say this one's like significantly worse. It's not even like of the same year of construction. Um, and so these are obviously not really the comps that I would pull. And uh, this one we're going to say is close and it's going to be like um, pretty much the same as the subject value. And then you can put comments in here, but any comments that you do, if you want it to show up in your report, you're going to click this little box. If you just are putting that there so that you can reference it later, don't click the little box. And the rule of thumb is, you know, just like when you're 
creating your file name in transaction desk. You do not want to say biggest pain in the butt client I've ever dealt with at 6301 <laughs> because when you send them authentic signs, it says biggest pain in the butt I've ever dealt with at 6301, blah, 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 has a signing. <laughs> Just saying early in the transaction desk changeover, that may have happened and we heard about it. Um, so but the Court of Ethics just says we can't say bad things about each other. It's right. that we can't say bad things about our clients. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Not in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, was, I was like, I don't know if I was selling my, my brother's house, I probably would do that. <laughs> right? Yeah. You just, they're, they're about to protect a class, but you might not have a job here. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. You. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so then you can, you know, say first, second, third, fourth up at the top. If you want to list it from low price to high price or high price to low price, you can shuffle them around. And then you're pretty much ready to say update my valuation. So because of all the little shifting that we did, it made an $860 change to the subject value. And now it's saying, oh, the subject property is worth $400. Sixty-nine thousand uh, or sixty-seven thousand. If you don't like that number, you're like, oh, wait, no, that's too high. Well, anything that you made better or worse or those things, you're going to go adjust those sliders to get to the number that you know in your head it should be. So you're going to reevaluate your comps, and then you're going to create a report. And it's going to make a nice little pretty report. And then I go from using a mini report to a full property report. So this property report has. 81 pages to it like they really think that you spent massive amount of time let's go ahead and view a sample so you can see so here's a sample it's going to start with the cover page and then it's going to go on and it's going to say your estimated value is going to say these are the facts it's going to show that you corrected information from public record then these are your extended home facts. And this is sort of everything that the seller never knew. Um, and then the property photos that are the history. And you can kind of say, this is what people that are kind of digging in and interested. This is what they're going to see. Oh, they bought this house and they haven't done anything to it. We've all heard that, right? They, you know, they paid this much money for it and all of that. And so you can deal with and start talking about a lot of the objections and things that they can overcome and the buyer's mindset. And what you're doing is getting them realistic to your pricing recommendation, right? So you're showing them everything that a good realtor is going to have access to, does a lot of different charts and graphs. You can exclude any of these pages from your report by simply saying, don't give me that page, don't give me this page. Um, and then you can print it or you can email it. I tend to email it to them as a PDF and bring it with me that we go through on my computer because it's 81 pages. If they want to print it off, they can kill their own trees. Um, but I go through it and say, you have a copy of this, go ahead and review it. I will bring a copy of it. And then I'm easily going to scan through to the pages that I want to highlight that are important in the conversation that we're going to have. But now you've done an 81 page report and they just think you're absolutely fabulous because you've really taken such a deep dive after coming out there and seeing it. So there's one that I like even more though than those two reports. And that is the other way to do a CMA. So if we go back here to home and we're gonna go down here. Oh gosh, you get all the little pop-ups from them, huh? Um, and we're going to go back to recent properties, so you don't have to type it again. And remember, you're just going to pull it, and that's going to pull your recent. You also have down there recent reports, recent homes that you've done searches for. So that's a quick way for you to access your work that you've done before. We're going to hit CMA value again, and it gives you two choices. So it gives you one where it's the sliders, but see right here where it says select your analysis type. Oh my goodness, I'm going to give sorry. them feedback. If you click underneath the RSVP, it'll say not to show. Don't you. show me that anymore. Um, so this right here, it's like sales comparison analysis evaluation. That's going to really get you into the nitty gritty. So much so that they're like, hey, some appraisers in the country actually utilize this. So you can put your broker, you can just skip this step. This is really more for like, I'm a licensed appraiser. And so now you're going to do the same basic things. You're going to confirm the facts. And we're going to say, yes, all of that is true. 
you're going to find your comps. Do you want to copy the comps you chose for this property? Yes, I do. Because we just used the slider bar once and now say, oh, I think this appraisal is going to be tough. Now I'm going to do from the property report that I did for the homeowner. Now I'm going to put one together for the appraiser or for the buyer's agent that's questioning my value. Yeah. So I was working with this this weekend on a $1.5 million home. Those sliders, the max they go to is $50,000. Yeah. It was doesn't like, work I, in I can't even adjust a kitchen. You have to do this yeah. report. No, I have yeah. to flip to that. You have to flip to this report. So then we're going to adjust the comps. And this is where you get the really fancy report, right? So now I can say, okay, all of them have four bedrooms. All of them have two baths. I'm not going to make any adjustments for that. But down here, oh, this is north-south exposure. This one is North South exposure too. I might make an adjustment for this East West and I might say, okay, I'm going to take off um, $3,000 because that's less of a, of a desirability in Arizona. Um, this one has a mountain view. And so because it's a mountain view, I'm going to say, oh, okay, I'm going to take off $7,000 because we like our mountain views. And again, all of this is going to be based off of your understanding. This one's 52 years old. I'm going to take off $10,000 because it's 52 years old and it hasn't been, you know, gutted down to the slab. <laughs> and don't forget um, what she's doing. We talked about last week, and you probably have notes on it. Wouldn't know. But CBS is if the comp is better, you subtract because we never add or subtract from the one that we're actually comparing. And then SBA, if the subject oh, sorry. is better, uh, you're right. I should be doing half. plus ten. Sorry. So Thanks, comp Mandy. Is better subtract. There we go. So comp is worse. We're gonna say if this was a newer house, it would be worth ten thousand dollars more. Thank you. If this had north-south exposure, it would be worth $3,000 more. Mm -hmm. There we go. And if this had a mountain view, thanks, Mandy. My mind was backwards. There no, we go. No, that was, that was, it had a mountain view. Oh, wow. How are we seeing Oh, here? yes, you're right. Negative. No, no, no. no. Okay. Okay. Worse. I think it's happening in the there we go. Like 30 so this is better than the subject property. This is worse than the subject property. This is worse than the subject property. So worse you're adding, better you're subtracting. And you go down here, and now well, it's the to recover CBS. If the comp is better, you subtract value. If yeah. the subject is better, you add value. Yeah. Are you just guessing on these numbers, or do you have? So I'm. I'm. So again, this is where your market knowledge comes right. into play. And if you don't know it, then what I would do is go to the MLS. And I would do a broad range of search of everything's apples to apples, except there's a three car garage. And then everything's apples to apples, except there's a two car garage. What's your differential? And then that's going to help you understand. And then you want to print those summaries and attach it if you're giving it to an appraiser so that you can say, well, the reason I adjusted $8,500 for a third car bay was because in this neighborhood or in this zip code or in this one mile radius, whatever you're utilizing mm -hmm. in that area, if you take apples to apples, four bedroom, two bath, you know, lot square footage, age of house, single level, blah, blah, blah. And the only difference that I give it is a three car garage and a two car garage. The differential is this, and here's the reports to prove it. So everything that you should do is based off of either I sell so many houses in this area. I know the difference between a two car and a three car, or you're going into the MLS and you're running those two different profiles to find out what the differential is. What if you're having to go back? I, I typically don't get this particular, unless I know, like you said, but let's say you're having to go back six months, mm -hmm. which let's say a year. Yep. Very different market. Yeah. So it's really hard to value what a three-car garage right. is at work now versus a year ago. Do you try and keep it within our basic 90 days that we're using right now? No, I just try to keep it within the same time period to get enough data to make it substantial. So I'm just looking for the difference between a three-car garage and not a three-car garage in a given little subject area. I might search a year's worth of closing, everything two-car garage, but everything else the same, everything three-car garage, but two, you know, but uh, everything else the same to get my comparison and you know so the bigger the data pool the more accurate the average is going to be when when you're substantiating it and then there's this add new row 
And this is where you can get really, really quite fancy. So you can start to edit different things that aren't even above. Kitchen remodels would be something. Um, Arizona room was added on would be something. Anything that's something substantial of value that you want to make note of. Um, wooden shutters were just installed in the house and that pr the price of that was X number of dollars. Whatever it is, you can start to edit the custom facts. And no custom facts have been defined, sorry. I've got to add it. So um, I can hit do 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 number of buildings, basements, foundation features. Oh, this is not working for me. Edit custom facts and figures. You can add lines in here, basically. Why is it not doing that? And then you wait it. Select a custom fact area. So foundation features. So right here, I might call it, right now, I don't know why it's not giving me a blank. Oh, here, just add a new row. No, I don't know why it's doing this. Edit custom fact types. Oh, here we go. So then you, I can basically say a custom, oh, Mandy doesn't have, oh, I already have these tabs in mind. Sorry, I'm using Mandy's. Okay, so Sorry. I'm gonna say kitchen remodel um, and I'm gonna add a custom row in there. But So here I would type kitchen remodel and then I would say this one had a kitchen remodel. So that makes it better than the subject property. And if it's better than the subject property, I would have to say, okay, I'd have to take off value to make it match. And I'm going to take off 15,000 because they put in a new kitchen and it's the price point. And then down here, you have the option of saying, this one closed the most recent, this one closed the furthest out. This one's the closest to the subject property. This one is the furthest out. The, you know, so you're basically saying, I'm going to weight this one here as being about 50% of the evaluation. And then I'm going to, and it has to add up to a hundred. And so I'm going to say that comparable is more important basically. And then maybe I'm going to say this one is uh, 20 and this one down here is least like it. This one is 10. I think that was our, no, this one was our 52 year old one. So this one's 10, and then this one is another 20% of the value. But I really want to put the most consideration. Why is Mandy not there? Okay, um, 20. So now I've got 100%. It's saying the value is 379,550, and I'm going to hit apply that. And if I'm still not happy with the valuation, then I'm going to go in here and I'm going to start tweaking the things that were different. Because if my market knowledge says, no, I really need this sector to get down to 365, well, then I'm going to do a heavier adjustment on the things that made the other subject properties different. Ultimately, the reason RPR works is it's using the knowledge inside your head. It's using your local market knowledge to make it easy for you to put together 74 page and 84 page reports basically. And then after you're done playing with it and you've got the value down here that, that you're looking for, you're gonna say update the valuation and close. And it's thinking about it. And then you're gonna create a report and you're gonna choose the valuation report. And that's gonna say valuation workbook and you're gonna download it, and this is what it's gonna look like. So pretty similar, but here, I think it's on this page. Oh, there's the public remarks, extended home facts, lots of pictures, and you can exclude a lot of this if you've already done it before. Here's where it's gonna start showing you those comparable properties. They're gonna be on the map, and then here it's gonna give you those side-by-side -side comparisons that you did where you made actual adjustments to the comp. And then it's really hard for your seller to argue the pricing with you, especially if you've done the work in the MLS to say the two car garage versus the three car garage, right? If someone says, well, how do, why are you giving $7,500, you know, because of a three car garage? Oh, well, here's why. Because over the last year, a extra one car bay on average brought $7,500 more if everything else was the same. And so that's, um, that is the nitty gritty. That's how you can utilize RPR in your listings, three different reports, depending on the level of refinement that you need. And you can do all of this from their mobile app too, if your eyes are really good. <laughs> yeah.
So um, the mobile app, we just go to the app store, don't we? Yeah, you go to the app store, you download RPR and the same credentials. This thing has a really cool commercial tool too. So if we go back to the home screen of RPR, right here, there's a little toggle and you can hit commercial. And one of the fun reports inside commercial. So let's say, what's the zip code here? Eight five zero two eight. 85028. Okay, so if we go to RPR commercial and we say we want 85028 and we're going to hit enter. And then from there, you go to your create a report. And here you can do a trade area analysis report. And inside that trade area analysis report, it gives you cool demographic information without you violating fair housing. It calls them like soccer moms. It calls them um, the different headers are pretty cool. So it's a great little tool too. If somebody sort of says, well, what's the area like, right? And all of us are like, eh, 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 no. No, no, there are very few safe ways for me to answer. Well, what's the area like, right? If you make it part of your standard practice for every buyer to say, I'm going to give you a commercial trade area report, it's just going to tell you a lot about the zip code in general that you've told me to search. If that's one of your standard operating procedures that you do every time with every client consistently, then you're able to provide them a lot of information. Professional pride, what does that one say? Soccer moms. Um, yeah, so it, it just kind of breaks it down for you in a different way with different information. And again, it's all provided by the National Association of Realtors, who I'm sure vetted that out through 50 billion attorneys to make sure that they were not doing any kind of violation. So that's it. That should be enough of a fire hose for you today. No, go ahead. Do you prefer this over the CMA on MLS? Yeah, so much more impressive in the report. So for me, it's always been about from the very first contact with a potential client, right, with a customer, building my value. So every contact that I'm going to make, every choice that I'm going to make, is all about building my value because I know if they respect me as the expert in the field, who's not lazy, who's doing work, who's earning the compensation that I'm going to charge them. I know I'm going to have a much smoother escrow where I can advise and they can decide. So I always take it as I'm here to give you information and I'm here to advise, but ultimately every decision is yours. And as long as your instruction to me is legal, then I'm going to be obedient. I, you know, I don't have any problems uh, I say to my clients, get over the whole, I don't want to make you uncomfortable. Like, make me uncomfortable. I'm a fiduciary agent for you. The reason you hired me is so that you don't have to be uncomfortable. I'll go be the person that says what you really want, but that you feel is mean or this or that. And, you know, we'll we'll have a conversation about it, and I'll tell you everything that my body of knowledge knows, and the risk and the reward, and the good and the bad, and then you make your decision, and then that's my marching orders. So it's um what we do is a process. Every time, every time we have that contact with the client, it's a process that these reports wow your clients, especially when you're using them. And they're designed so that you don't have to pour your entire day into property analysis to create and pull this kind of data. And only real for a Um, A couple of things that Susan said today that might have um, made you think differently. She said that she pulls it and she emails an idea of the price point. She then goes and views the property. Then she goes back and she refines the value and brings a new report. At what point are you asking for the listing contract? Oh, I'll tell you where I'm doing it. You guys don't know. Because I would say before I do the extended report. Yeah, they can always the be trying to get them. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure you didn't think Susan would ever walk out of a door without someone signing a listing and contract. Mm -hmm. Does a listing contract require the sales price, the list price, you know, the ultimate goal, it's not sales price, it's the list price, to be filled out at that moment? 
No. Can you do a listing addendum or a sole change form later? Mm -hmm. Can you write to be determined and put in additional terms after further evaluation? We'll be meeting to rediscuss listing price tactics, at which time we will define your listing value and a listing addendum will be signed. Can you make it that clear and concise? Yeah. So I never want you thinking that we're waiting for the third time to meet them to get that signed. Like I said earlier, Craig might be running for treasurer, but in my mind, Craig is the treasurer. You might be running to figure out the exact price point for the right tactics in today's market to really empower your client's knowledge base, but you never leave without a junior listing. Yeah, mini Why? property report Why? review. Because somebody may be doing the exact same thing you are, yep. and you're the second person you're the I don't want to work that hard if I'm not. That's right. Mini property report <laughs> review. So when I show up and see the house and I have I always have them walk me around it tell me what you like tell me what you don't like and then I have them sit down we talk about the elephant in the room which is always how much do I get paid um and we go through the entire package of this is how I would market it and ultimately the most important thing is that I get the most for your home with the best terms and conditions that are desirable to you that's why you're bringing me on. And now we've come to the part where I say, do you want to hire me to be your realtor? Do you feel comfortable working with me? And they go, oh, usually they're like, yes, let's go, let's go. Like, let me you know, give us more, give us more. Um, but I won't start to get specific into pricing and the evaluation of their home. So sometimes I'll get pushed out and say, what are you going to list your house for? And I say, I'm going to list your house for whatever you tell me to, but only after educating you about the value and the benefits and pitfalls with the decisions that you're about to make. But I'm going to be obedient because we already went over my fiduciary duty, but I would owe to you if you decide to hire me to be your realtor. But that's what I ask. Would you like to hire me to be your realtor? Can you repeat that? Uh, I get the post for your home with the desire of what you say. I said, you are bringing me on to be your fiduciary agent to represent you to get the highest price for your home with the best terms and conditions that are most desirable for you. I want to add something here. I appreciate the way you interject. I learned this a long time ago. She brought up the fact of asking for the listing. I, I traveled with a gentleman that sold construction bonds, and he taught me this lesson. He said, always ask for the order. Because if they say no, you are there to determine why they're not ready to give you the order. Mm -hmm. But if you leave, you don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's a good way to come back and say, okay, well, if you're not ready, what, what's holding you back from doing this? Mm -hmm. So ask for that order. It's discovery. So I um, I came from a background in timeshare. I was in the quality assurance plan that I wasn't a council. I was enforcing rules on down that were in the industry. <laughs> Um, but uh, and look what you're about to be doing. I know. <laughs> like, I'm not getting that on your resume. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so but one of the first things that you do in a 90 minute timeshare presentation, right? Because everybody comes in for the gift. Nobody is actually there because they ever thought they would buy a timeshare ever. So we do have people that we love, like just to buy more. Um, but uh, but most mostly people are there because the marketing team got a hold of them, offered them a very, very discounted vacation package, plus dinner, plus spa, plus whatever to get them through the door. And now you got 90 minutes and they came in with a plan. We are not buying points here today. Something, <laughs> something dark side. That's why I convince myself every time I talk to time yeah. Something, something dark side. Yeah. 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 Why does the husband who starts with this plan always get flipped in the middle of it? Like, well, it does seem like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, oh, my God. God. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. right. Yeah. right. Yeah. I'm telling you guys, yeah. if you want to take advantage of this, the best objection is we just bought an RV and we love camping. Mm. A time shift little person got nothing at that point. You know what they do? They walk into the break room and they go, well, <laughs> they're very angry. <laughs> but, but discovery is one of the first things that a time share salesperson is going to do. And what they're doing is deciding, they're formulating in their mind what path they're going to take in the sales process to get you to sign a contract for something you've already decided you're not going to buy in 90 minutes' time. And that discovery process is critical to the sales process. <laughs> I do the same thing when I go on a listing presentation. When I say, show me around your house, I ask questions like, 
So when you bought this house, what did you love about your realtor and the process and what was like, oh, I wish I had done that differently or I wish I had known more. Like, how did it feel when you were a buyer of the house? You know, it, what do you love the most about your house? What are you hoping to get out of your house? What What's your time frame? You know, and I'm just doing discovery along the way because I, I don't need them to say, there's a hole right there in my keys, because, right? I, I mean, I'm going to see those things. I'm going to say, so what happened there? And, you know, but you're doing it now as part of a conversation. So instead of the entire focus being on the condition of their property, I'm also reaching in and giving them like a little bit of love. And I'm learning how I'm going to customize my pitch that's getting ready to come next. Because next we're going to sit down and go through the mini property report. And at the end of the mini property report, all I'm going to do is talk range and customization and that there's a lot of work ahead of me in order to get them the correct pricing for the best terms and conditions. Right? And so you don't email them the mini report. You actually go over and take it. Well, I'll email it to them and that's how I get my appointment. I'll email it to them and I'll say I've just done a preliminary kind of scrub of the surface report to give you a ballpark idea. And at this stage, I need to come out and see your house so that I can utilize my area knowledge and skills to reach out to heard some yeah. coaching or whatever that I have on the university and say, don't see the house first. Don't let them take you for a tour. Go ahead and sit them down first and then do the presentation. There's a lot of different ways Everybody has, yeah. I like yours because yeah. it, I like the tour because that way I feel like I'm getting that connection yeah. and knowing how to play. And I don't like to invest too much time before they're willing to commit. So I just want to invest enough in them to establish my value, give them confidence in my skills, and that mini property report, I can literally have it done by the time I press, you know, end on my cell phone conversation with them. And then I send that over and I immediately, so as quickly as possible, go to make the appointment to get out there and refine the value. But you've already, in their mind's eye, done a substantial amount of work. They don't feel bad getting a mini property report and not at least giving them a chance to come see the house and talk to them. So the goal, I know I was coached years ago to be the last person they ever see. Let's say you can't be the last person. You go in, you give your presentation. Are you ready to hire me? No. Can you tell me why? I've got two more people to interview. Now, how much work do you do? You just wait until you've given them the mini report with the range. How much time do you spend on it between the point you finish and they make a decision? So I also limit the size of the practice part of my presentation is everything that I do in real estate and I talk about how there are different strategies as a real estate broker as to how you manage your volume but how I like to have direct control and be the only person that my clients are working with the point of contact I don't outsource to X, Y, and Z. Now, if I did, I would point out the benefits and the counselors and pay right. Right? It's a double edged sword. I'm mm -hmm. selling what I have per se. Right. And um, I always say that because I limit how many clients that I have, <laughs> if you are not ready to hire me as your realtor, I can't promise that I will have availability in my practice to take you on in two or three days. Well, there is Right, that's just, that's just, really good. just in, you know, like in full transparency, as we talked about it, I limit the number of clients that I take on. I'm very busy. I receive new leads all the time, and it's first come, first serve. And I, you know, I talked about because I'm also setting boundaries in that first meeting, mm -hmm. you know. So I basically say if it's urgent, and it's after seven o'clock in the evening, or it's on a Saturday or Sunday, and there's something urgent, you're going to lose sleep over it, you're fretting, you're worried, you just need to put urgent and then text me whatever it is, and you're going to get a response. Like, I'm going to spit the food out of my mouth and I get a response because it's an urgent to you. <laughs> but I have a family, I have a life outside of listing and selling houses, and if it's something that can wait until the next business day at eight o'clock in the morning, just don't put urgent in front of it. Right. And I'm going to address it at eight o'clock in the morning if you're going to hear from me in a timely way. So I'm setting expectations and value the entire time. Part of that is that I limit the number of clients that I work with at any given time because I want to be the best experience you've ever had in selling or buying a house. And yeah.
And she does that all the time. People always want what they can't have. Yeah. Right. Can you take that into account, like when you work with buyers and you have that? She does this too. Sorry. I, since you're here only for a limited time in this role, you know, we have to make sure to take full utilization. I share it all with you guys right um, now. Yeah. What's your number? You know, you're like, you're not recording, right? <laughs> um, is the time of acceptance when we work with a buyer when sellers say, no, I need three days to respond to you? She actually limits that still and has no parents. That's great. If your seller decides to negotiate with us, if my buyer's still around to be wanting this house, we'll re extend that time period at that time. But I don't want to give guarantees and will not lock my buyer into a corner of only being able to negotiate with you. And that's basically what you're asking us to do. But you say it so much better. To remember that one? <laughs> I love that one. I, I do. Um, <laughs> I, I will call the listing agent and I'll say, how much time do you need to present? You know, because I want to be courteous, and sometimes they'll say, "Oh, well, I need three days," and I'll say, "Oh, well, I'm really sorry. We, I'm going to, to go ahead and write this up as a 24-hour or a you know 48-hour uh, response time, because I have appointments on this day to show the buyers more houses in the event that this is the one for them, and I can't lock my clients down into. But we can keep an open line of communication, and if ours is the highest and best offer, as long as my clients haven't found something they love more, you know how big the buyers are. Boom. <laughs> exactly. I'm always like, and tell me more. You know, if you present my offer now, or this offer might not be here, and then you're going to have a whole lot of fun explaining why the highest and best offer walked away from the table because it wasn't convenient for you to present it at that time. Or you thought that you could be better. It better be your seller's strategy and them instructing you, not you telling them that's the best way for them to proceed because you use that highest and best buyer. And then they're finally complaining against you. With a commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you know, the law business presents all offers. So, yeah. yeah. Who's excited for taking you back? Like, oh, so the other yeah. I do. I do. I do. I like having those conversations too of like, oh, really? Where is that in the purchase contract? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I know it and I teach it and I help revise it and I do all those things, but I'm not familiar with that clause. Could you point it out? Yeah, I, I want to be that. I want to be her. I want to learn new things. Is that an invisible ink? And sometimes the answer is yes. If you're going to start emails, because I have found out people can hide things. You have to go and hide them, but not in the contract. Not in the contract. Not in the right. contract. Like the marching orders are pretty, like right there. I've done that to escrow officers too. Escrow officers have said, like, well, you know, it needs to be blah, blah, blah. I'm like, really? Where's that in your escrow instructions? Should we review it line by line? Julia just smiles and nods and whispers. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's continue to move forward. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, so that's been three years old. Hopefully, that'll help you guys work smarter, not harder, have some different tools and customize it. And I think the other thing, the most important thing, is really make it yourself. You know, you can, it doesn't mean no good to go in and try to be Mandy, it doesn't mean no good to try to be.